Welcome to Script to Screen's Talks podcast. Script to Screen is a charitable organisation dedicated to developing the craft and culture of storytelling for the screen in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This talk series brings the creative community together to hear inspirational speakers talk about their creative process, craft, philosophy, or the creative landscape. Script to Screen is pleased to share Kickstart Your Screenwriting Career, a conversation with Briar Gray Smith, Michael Bennett, and Pip Hall. These three highly accomplished and successful writers share their stories about the pathways they took to a career in the screen industry. Pip Hall writes for television and theatre and has won awards in both mediums. Pip's most recent works are Jonah and One Lane Bridge. Briar Gray Smith writes for feature films and TV series. Most recently, Briar wrote and co-directed the feature film Cousins and was a writer for season two of Rudangi. Michael Bennett writes across many mediums, including novels, TV series and feature films. His most recent release is The Gone, but our audience will know miniseries In Dark Places and feature film Matariki. His novel Better the Blood is currently being adapted for the screen. Jackie Dennis, Executive Director of Script to Screen, moderated the conversation, which was held in August of 2023 at the Screen Canterbury New Zealand offices. My first question, and I think we'll start with you, Pip, is uh, what was... What inspired you to write in the first place? Uh, well, I think I was quite late coming to writing, so I wanted to be a professional basketball player, um, which in the 80s wasn't a real legitimate career. Uh, and I, so I grew up in Dunedin and I went to university having no idea what I wanted to do and failed spectacularly in law and economics because it wasn't a very good fit. Um, and then I went, uh, my parents went to London for a year and I went and they very generously said, you can go to any theatre show that you would like. So me and my brother went to like 50 shows. And it was such a gift because it really, um, I remember sitting there going, oh, I reckon I could do this. I think it was like there was something in, in that kind of live p- performance space and that made me, that really drew me in. So I went to Otago University and did drama and kind of found a calling and found a good group of mates and just started, you know, like doing other people's work, but then wanting to create my own. So that's right. really where that kind From of... performing to writing. Yeah, and it was really cool having, um, like, your own voice and what was important to you at that time. And I remember, you know, all through my writing career, the opportunity to kind of look at the human condition, where you are in that life stage and kind of exploring... Um, being able to voice that and share that with an audience is something I re- still really get a lot out of. And um, Briar, I think you started in theatre as well. Yeah, I, um, well, my mother took me to, I always loved to write as a child. I was really a quiet person. I still am quite a quiet person. Um, but so I used to write a lot and um she took me to, she loved theatre and she took me to stage plays and she took me to, when I was about seven years old, a play called Happy Days by Samuel Beckett, which was at the Hannah Playhouse, it was called then, it's now downstage. And it was literally, she took a whole lot of her grandchildren as well. Um, and there was like eight of us children and they all fell asleep. Back in the days, we, it was actually a restaurant you could you ate a meal while you watched a play, <laughs> but um, I stayed up and watched the play, and I was really astounded by the way um, that you had two actors and there was an invisible writer that someone was writing the words. So I really um, began to aspire to be a playwright. Um, I started out as a journalist um, for the Evening Post, and uh, the first job that they gave me gave me, it was a page called the Youth Focus page, was to go and interview a Māori theatre company up the road. I was only 17. And um, the Māori theatre company was auditioning. It was called Te Ohu Whakari. They were auditioning and they needed one more woman in the theatre company. So I I told them I was there to audition. (laughs) 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 Then I got the part. So I um, started out as an actor and became more involved as a writer, um, mentored by Api Taylor, who was older and quite an established writer and he was also in the company. So it kind of grew from theatre and then into television and films. 
It's like grabbing the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just go with the flow, that's me. And Michael, what about you? Yeah, um, well, first, kia ora koutou, tēnei te mihinu i kia koutou, um, and to the mano whenua, uh, thank you for the beautiful welcome. Um, really so lovely to be on you, sharing the, um, the stage with, with you guys. It's awesome. Um, my mum was a really amazing writer. She met my dad uh, when she was writing the biography of his dad, who was the first bishop of, the first Māori bishop of Aotearoa. And... Um, so I kind of feel like I got from both sides, I got this kind of real love from, for, of words from mum and from dad, who was a decorated Spitfire pilot. He was one of seven brothers who went to World War II. Um, uh, seven went away and seven came back, um, and which was a very unique experience for Māori families in World War II. Um, so I got from dad, I guess, a, a, a real sense of like um, fighting for things that are worth fighting for. And the two threads, I think, came together in, in my desire to write. Um, but I was brought up, I was brought up, I was, I'm a West Coaster. I was born, well, I'm from Te Arawa, um, but I was born in Reefton and raised in a tiny one-horse town that's so small it doesn't even have a horse and called Nati Moti up the river from Motueka. And, and you kind of like have absolutely no idea that there's such a thing as screenwriting, that people earn money, earn money doing this stuff that turns up on television and the films. So, um, so I just kind of, when I went to university, I followed my passion, which was psychology. And, uh, and it's still, that was my first degree and it's still, you know, I did other degrees, but in, in film and television, but uh, that still is for me the most important degree for what I do now. Um, curiosity about the human mind and about the, the wondrous things that we're capable of and the terrible things we're capable of. Um, so I did psychology, but really knew that I would be crap at being a counselor. Um, and really still wanted to write. Um, so I sort of um, eventually ended up doing this kind of really amazing course that just had, gave you tastes of journalism, like photography, and, and there was one little course in there on screenwriting, and it was just like the first hour of that course was just like, oh, yes, that's what I've been waiting it. for the, the whole that? of my life. Where it was, was in where Perth. Was... Perth. Perth. Oh. Yeah, right. I'd followed a, a girl to Perth. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> ah, that's that's interesting. I guess what I'm curious about now is um, what I'm going to ask each of you. What was your first paid job, and how did you get discovered to be offered that paid job? You know, was there a thing that you did where someone then said, "Hey, I really love what you did, and and I'll pay you to write this." So. Pip, let's go with you first again. So my first paid job was actually with Michael. So my first paid job was a sketch comedy show called Skits in the mid-90s. Um, and I was a writer and a performer. And how that came about was when I was at university, I was in a, a comedy group. And so we kind of wrote our own sketches and performed them. It was really fun. And we came away mainly because it was a fun weekend away to uh, kind of the university comedy competitions. Um, and we perform we all performed all the universities. It was really fun. And Dave Gibson, who was the producer of Skits, was there. And um, at the time I had like shaved my head and it was like really, really short blonde hair. <laughs> and um, at the end of the show there was a big party and he came to the party and like he came and he actually shoulder tapped me. Like I was talking to someone, he like tapped me on the shoulder and he said, we'd really like it if you came and auditioned to write and perform for our show. And I was like two months out from graduating and it was time for me to move from Dunedin to Wellington. So it was like, it was like a, perfect. A perfect. It yeah. felt really magical and special. So you... That's Dave Gibson from Gibson Group who was, had a production company. But Michael was working on skits and yeah. you... So you were, I joined it on the second series and right. Michael was part of the writing right. team then. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't realise that. That's interesting. So um, right place, right time. Yeah. And I guess um, doing what you love and that, you know... And that shines through. Yeah. Yeah. So it, f it felt pretty um, out of the box. So I'm still, I still find that quite amazing. What about you, Brian? Um, so I came from theatre, so I had 
been doing a lot of theatre and I was um, asked by Fiona Copland, I think it was about 2000 or something, to, she was commissioning for Television 3 and they, were, they had those, the series of one-hour dramas um, and asked me if I could submit an idea. So I did and it was a show called Fishkin's Suit. Um, it's an hour long and funnily enough, Michael became my script mentor or my script mentor. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and my ex directed it. So and, right? yeah. <laughs> it's very all closely connected. I didn't connected. know this when yeah. uh, we put the, the group together. It's nice. I like it. coincidences. Yeah. So Pip, you you shaved your head and that helped. I had dreadlocks down to here yeah, when, so I, when I met it, Dave Gibson. He and a, I think he's that a hair thing. Helped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, I just I was in my second year at film school in Australia and. I wanted a kind of a holiday job, and I wrote to Dave, and um, and and he gave me this gig, and it turned into a year, and and I went from skits to um, a one-hour show you might remember called Cover Story, um, and and yeah, and, and that was amazing. The thing with the sketch comedy, um, which I think was really a really useful training ground, was that every day we had to produce like seven, eight, nine, ten, and they're like little short films um, because. You know, a sketch, it's not just a punchline. Like, if it's a punchline in, in search of a story, you've got a problem. And it's much better to have kind of a story that's in search of a punchline. And you, so it was a real practice of three-act structure and, and storytelling and seven times a day. Um, and so it was grueling. But, um, and it was an amazing environment. Like, it was, there, was, there was us and then there was Raven Khan and Oscar Kitely and Jermaine Clements yeah. and... Um, it was a really, it was a really interesting bunch of people. I think the thing I remember, it really taught me a really valuable lesson, which is, I think there's often a perception that um, there's not that many ideas. Like you just, you just had to come up with ideas. Like there is always more ideas, which was a really useful um, thing when you are writing, because our season we we worked for nine months, every day having to turn up and write, like, 10 sketches. So, you know, that was really useful, I think. Going, there will all be turnover. more ideas, yeah. Yeah, the high turnover sort of um, means that you're having to generate work all the time. So, you yeah. learn. Because I, you know, sometimes... And you, you're seeing it. I guess you can see whether it's working or not. Yeah. Yeah, with in the most excruciating way because you have you yeah. have round table read throughs, oh. and <laughs> when it's just silence at the end of your sketches, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. swallowing me up earth. Yeah. Oh, wow! But also, yeah, the idea that you know, I feel like sometimes as writers we wait for inspiration to hit, and in a job like that, you you don't have time for inspiration. You just have to really work your idea muscle really hard, and so you're like a magpie, and everywhere you go, you're in like hunting for story ideas in the paper, talking to your friends, you're on the bus. So that, that was really useful too. Um, a lot of people talk about Shortland Street being like a training ground because so many writers in New Zealand have gone through and done a period of time writing for Shortland Street. Have any of you written for Shortland Street? All three of you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. How long, let's start with you, Michael. How long yeah. did you write there um, for? I lasted two months. Um, okay. Which is not to, you know, I mean, it's it's an awesome training ground, and mm -hmm. um, but it, it just it really it didn't fit me at all. Um, but but that was absolutely fine. Um, you know, it's uh, it's produced, and there's still people that um, who have got extraordinary careers that are still doing Shaw and Street. How long were you doing it? For? Oh, it was probably three months. Okay, but I was going away, and um, so I told them I was going away, and they. Yeah, that was it. Okay. They didn't ask me back. Right. And and how long, Pip, for you? Um, I was, so I would go and fill in. So I did an initial three-month stint, and then I kind of came on in short stints for about 15 years. Just um, sometimes like one week, which was quite hard to just drop in because you'd read all the back. You know, it's like about um, probably about four months from what's on screen to what's been written, so that's quite a lot to catch up. Um, on um, through to I think like three or four months was my, like so were you number. a storyliner a storyliner I, I was just writing so I'd get the storylines sent <coughs> and yeah yeah mm. yeah no I was just writing scripts so all oh, right okay 
So just talk through the difference between what a storyliner does and what the writers are doing, that, you know, the difference that Briar just pointed out. So the storyliners um, kind of are the story engine room of the play. So basically the producers and a couple of the head writers uh, every three or four months come up with the big arcs of what the characters are doing. So things like uh, people getting, you know, relationships breaking up, people getting sick, job things, all of that. And then every week you have to write five episodes of story. So you take the arcs where you know that the characters are going to go and you have to come up with an episode structure um, and five cliffhangers. And so you write that five episodes into a, like a prose document and then that gets sent to the scriptwriters. Mm. And it's, um, and the story tables for all major, like for all the series that we've, like for Rurangi and um, mm. One Lane Bridge, I'm sure you had, to, and for Gone and Vegas and, and they're, they're fantastic places. That's they, they, just so much energy and, um, um, and everyone just, you know, you, you, you've got the thread of the series, like, you know, what you just described with Shortland Street, you've got the the overall arc of the six episodes or whatever it is, usually, and and then it's kind of about really deepening each of the episodes and taking it to unexpected places and, and you know, the, and what's really great is when you get people who aren't actually in the industry coming in just um, to to bring a completely different perspective, like a cop or, or a... Mm. And so yeah. you have authenticity of character. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So, um, how many? Just out of curiosity, with the gone, how many? Like, there were two writers on that, wasn't there? You and one other from Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. And is that it, or did you have other people supporting you in the background? Yeah. So we did have um, over the course of so because we started just before pandemic and and had a story table in, in Dublin then with um, um, maybe three or four storyliners and the head writer, the two head writers. So to keep the series truly, you know, it was always wanted to be, wanted it to be a truly, co-productions can often suffer from a dominant side and an inferior side. And we really didn't want that to happen with the gone. Like this was, we really wanted the Irish storytelling and the New Zealand slash Maori storytelling to be really equally weighted. So it yeah, it feels that way, eh? Um, and so we had things like an uh, Irish director and a New Zealand director and Irish production company and New Zealand production company and two equal head writers basically. And, and we were very protective of our own patches. And if anything, it was just like, I was always trying to get the New Zealand stories a bit bigger and she was always trying to get the Irish stories and it made for, yeah, a, a very equal kind of storytelling, I think. Yeah. So in a situation like that, or even um, Briar with Rurangi and Pip with One Name Bridge, I mean, do everyone here is sort of thinking, how do I kickstart my career? <laughs> so do you bring newbies in to work with you or... Um, I guess it's different for each situation. You're not in your head, Briar. Tell us about um, what happened on Rurangi, for example. Yes, yeah, so we had a mixture of people in our story room at various stages of our career. And I guess the, the most emerging writer there was um, Awapuna, who's now working with you. Um, just to, and to make sure that everyone, because it's a very diverse it covers very diverse communities, so making sure that we had authentic voices coming from, um, and that we were growing people within those communities who could go on and work as writers and directors. And we did the same um, when we sh when we shot Rudangi. We had um, so we Grey Meek, who's over here. She was um, the my flatmate in directing the intern. Um, so yeah, we. We, we had a lot of um, emerging people, different stages of their career on, on the crew, um, writers and, yeah. and directing in turn. Did you have any new writers on One Lane Bridge? Well, One Lane Bridge was quite a different model. So we didn't, I didn't have a writer's room because I was really fortunate to write every episode of the 16 episodes that we did. That um, very really happens that in New Zealand. That very really happens. Did it feel good? It did feel really good. Like it was like 
a huge amount of work and the stress. But what the great thing about it, which often doesn't get to happen in TV, is that um, with episodic uh, drama series, often there's lots of different writers and a head writer that kind of holds the vision and kind of does rewrites. But because I was doing all of the scripts at Mensch, I could work on the series as a whole instead of episode by episode. So often, so the first... Um, series was six and then we did five and five. So often I would have written first drafts for all of them and then in episode four I'd be like, oh, actually I thought of something way better and change it in episode four and then be able to go back and rewrite episodes one, two and three because we have that um, luxury of it all just being in one brain and so we could kind of um, ping around. So that really... Um, I think that really helped strengthen the work and it meant that we could... Um, kind of do more drafts than normal. Mm. But I I also, yeah, it's it's not an idea, like it's got some really good things creatively, but also I'm really um, mindful that we didn't get to develop new writers because um, I think that is, it's a really important place mm. to kind of be learning with people who are kind of match fit. I think that's a, a good way to yeah. impart knowledge. I think one of the things I've noticed with a lot of, screenwriters is that they have another string to their bow, you know, or a side hustle. Um, diversification. Uh, I'm just wondering if each of you, Michael, do you have, um, well, I've already talked about the fact that you write novels. I guess that's, um, is yeah. there anything that you do that's not writing? I think you just have many different writing. Um, yeah. No, I've, I've sort of like been quite committed to writing as a thing. But I guess the, the side hustle, oh, there's one point where kind of when there was a dip in the industry, I actually got an Uber license. Um, I got an Uber license and then I looked at my photo on the Uber license and I looked so depressed. I thought, this is just, <laughs> this is the wrong thing to do. So I threw the Uber license away. Um, um, the, the side hustle that has been amazing for me has been, um, I, I taught for, well, you know, teaching it with script screen and, um, Nahu Fakari and um, uh, the Film Commission uh, in terms of mentoring new writers, and but also um, I, I teach it. Uh, I used to teach at a private film school in Auckland, uh, South Seas, and that is um, the absolute best thing for for me. It was ex just extraordinary having to enunciate uh, how you do what you do, and having to kind of like um, pass that on and 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 try and use that to uh, help, you know, new idealistic writers improve their craft was, uh, yeah, was really good for my own writing, definitely. Actually, um, Michael Bennett taught screenwriting for the Northland Youth Group um, four-day workshop that we did in the school holidays, and Jamie, who I work with, my colleague, came back going, wow, the way that Michael taught writing was just so, you know, he was he was really excited by what he observed with what you did in Northland a couple of months ago. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, my side, my side yeah. gig is, though I don't my, mainly work as a writer, but I do a lot of script consultation. So I think for about five years have been taking um, or a mentor um, on South Auckland, Auckland Shorts run by Script to Screen which is a gig I really love. Um, and you're yeah, just mentoring um, more emerging writers and sometimes not so emerging, just being an outside voice for um, screenwriters in particularly, particular. Mm. Pip, your side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I do a little bit of that. I do some um, kind of script consulting. Um, sometimes I do Airbnb. Uh, so that was... Uh, a good way to, because some years are lean, you know, so it's, um, I think being a, one of the great things about being a writer though is that you're at the front end of the food chain so you can, um, you can keep generating work even if it's not kind of paid. But um, yeah, I did some Airbnb and I also uh, formed <laughs> in a past life with one of my girlfriends, a giant water ballet company, um, which had about 88 performers, uh, which, yeah, and did some TED Talks and did um, some shows and, yeah. Oh, another little side hassle I um, 
do or did is a bit of acting. And so that's a really good complementary skill, I think. And sometimes I would be get little parts, but sometimes I'd be an extra. And so I, that's a really cool um, side hustle that is really complementary. Um, and it's really great to get on a film set. Like if you haven't been on a set, it's really useful to kind of see how they work. And then there's a lot of waiting around as an extra, so then you can just do your writing quietly over here. <laughs> and you get paid and you meet people. It's quite fun. I think you're holding out on us, though. I'm sure there's another side hustle that oh. you're flying back to Dunedin oh, for Oh, side hustle. Oh, I'm also manager basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> the Southern Hoi Ho. So they're... Um, it's cool. We've got a. Um, is that the one you mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like how, no, that's because what I, I had more side hustles that I was no yeah, holding out on. <laughs> In your career, have you has anyone given you some advice that was just magic, exactly what you needed at the time, uh, that was to encourage you to keep writing or show you a different way of writing or just anything that was some advice that was given to you that you would share today. So, I mean, when I went to film school in Sydney, when I figured out that this is what I want to do with my life, um, like I had three years, it was the best school in Australasia at the time. It was amazing. But, um, but actually I learned everything I was going to learn in the first hour of, the, of the, the first day in the first hour where the head of screenwriting, who's an amazing writer, Paul Thompson, gave us a one-hour talk on three-act structure. Um, and it's, it was something that kind of I'd kind of known inside, kind of how it all worked, and it, but not being it, it was the first time anyone had clearly sort of stated how storytelling works in almost every culture on the planet, and every kind of storytelling from songwriting to eulogies to knock knock jokes, um, and that in a way. Um, so, I mean, when I teach, I kind of like, that's the focus of my teaching. I, I kind of tell my students, you can help these really rich people who write textbooks um, get richer, like Linda Seeger and William Goldman, but you don't need to because actually the principle is really simple and then it becomes about practice, about doing it yourself. Honing your craft. Mm. Um, if not something that you were told, um, well, you all have children, and if they woke up one morning and said, I'm going to be a screenwriter, what advice would you give them? Well, I can uh, go back to the other question because I Oh, okay. Think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether someone told me this or someone asked me this, but it was about um, writer's block, um, which we all get. And so we were just, and maybe I was talking to a writer friend, so we were just kind of talking about um, strategies to kind of help with writer's block. Um, and so some of the things we came up with were, which I find really super useful, is when I get stuck, sometimes you go, oh, I can't move forward because I don't know how to, where to go next. And so what I do and my friend was doing is to not be bound to tell story in a linear fashion because there's probably somewhere down in the story a scene that you're really dying to get to, but it's like way down the end of your film or your TV thing. And so now what I do is I just go to that bit and I write the bit that's a, a jigsaw piece and I don't know necessarily where it will go, but I'm like, oh, okay, great. And I get into there and I just write that scene. And then as I'm writing it, then the scene before and after kind of forms. So the idea that you don't have to do it in a straight line, that you can just write these little islands of bits and then as you are writing, more connections mm -hmm. come. So that was a really useful tool. And then the other thing that I find is that when I'm in a writing kind of session and you're in the flow, that's when more ideas form. I think that seems like quite a common thing for writers I've talked to. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I don't write myself out. I save one of those really good ideas mm -hmm. for another session so that when I'm arriving at the computer, I've got a really exciting starting point. Mm -hmm. So rather than having the horrible blank piece of paper that's just like so scary, <laughs> there, is a, there is a jumping off point. And 
then you get into that and then you're writing and then more ideas will form. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to save that for next time. So those are a couple mm. of quite good um, pointers that I found that helped me and my friends were talking to a writer's block. Briar, I thought you nodding. Um, yeah, and no, I was thinking of the, the most profound advice I got. And I don't know if it was the best, but it, best advice I ever got, but at the time it was the best advice. I went to uh, the Sundance Writers Laboratory and I don't know when it was, 2008 or something like that, and um, took a The Strength of Water, which was a feature film play. And one of my characters was stuck. You know, he was um, trying to get over the grief of his dead sister and what he did to get over that grief was kind of a cop-out. Like, she loved this chicken and she had a pet chicken and he threw it off the cliff and it flew. You know, it was like, oh, you know, everything's all right. And there was a screenwriter called Stuart Sturm who wrote Rebel Without a Cause. He died about four years ago. He was an incredible man and he takes you for a writer's meditation. And he takes you back to, you're supposed to go, you're supposed to take your character back to childhood. And he asked your character a series of questions and you identify your character's flaw or their fear and the obstacle, because all characters probably should have an obstacle or a, a wound that they have to, or an ache they have to overcome to get through and, um, or not, but by the end of the show, and give us all a glimpse of their magnificence, and off they go. Um, I did the exercise, and I thought it, I had to ask the questions of myself, and I realised um, by asking the questions of myself that, that I had this flaw <laughs> and it was to make everything okay. So, you know, to um, not face consequences, not face that anything bad had happened. I'd just imagine it away or I'd go to sleep or something. So that, that all came out in that exercise. And so I realised then that what was holding my screenplay back is I wasn't letting um, my character face the death of his sister, um, which seems like, come on, it's pretty obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me. I was so close to the character, I was protecting this character. Mm -hmm. So in realising that in myself, I realised it in my character and was able to push the character further and make him um, really come to terms with... Um, the death of his sister and acknowledge it. And it, it took off after that. It really started to fly. It was quite a massive, massive moment. Fantastic. Mm. That tool that you were given on going deep is something that um, writers need to find mm -hmm. for themselves and their characters um, to really get their screenplay to have, um, I'm trying to find the word, sorry, one of you might help me, but that going deep is absolutely crucial, isn't it? Um, and it can be quite surprising what you discover yeah. about yourself yeah. as you're trying to unravel something about one of your characters. I think Story Camp at Script to Screen has a residential lab that goes for five days and Briar's very involved in that and the writers do a lot of work to go deep, mm. and I know, Michael, you've been to Story Camp as well. I don't know if you want to discuss any of the exercises you've done. I know there's working with actors mm. to get to know the character's body mm. and movement. And That was, um, so the, 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 the woman that um, Briar was talking about, Awapuna, um, worked with us on our, our film, which is a, um, a transgender dance story. Um, true, true story in the Cook Islands. And what was great, talk about facing your fear. So I had to work with Awa, who's an amazing actor, um, and we had, to, um, we had to do scenes together uh, in a, a piece of wood if, if I have to perform. It's just my total worst nightmare. But it was actually just so extraordinary to, to get inside the character's head and, and the result of that, of actually, you know... Um, uh, em embodying the character that I've been writing about, it, it, it did show me a whole lot of stuff that I hadn't thought about, but it also produced two whole new scenes that became pivotal scenes in, in the story where, where the character that I was working with opposite Awa's character had um, 
he was gay and had never come talk to his grandmother about it, and um, and there just became, in a funny kind of way, but this, it was entirely obvious that it's somewhere in the film he has to, and that came out of that that, that process of um, yeah of improv improving, and um, wow. so that was that was an amazing part yeah. of the yeah. The thing that scares you most is quite often the thing you should do, I think. Yeah. 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 Have you had one of those sort of go deep experiences that you're willing to share? <laughs> um, I guess for me, what I find really useful is really leaning into theme. Like what is, what is the theme of this work? No, what is it really? No, what is it really? Like it feels like it, it's an onion and you just, for me, the strongest things are just very human condition. They're quite simply explain like love or power or family or identity. They're all these things that we share as humans and every story will will boil down to what like one of those big themes. And when I look at my work and I feel like oh it feels a little bit ungrounded, it's usually because I'm not really, really clear with myself what the theme is. And then what's interesting though is like with so with plays you maybe do like 10 drafts like sometimes you do a draft and the theme is about one thing and then the next draft you go oh no 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 it's about something else so sometimes themes definitely change but for me that really anchors it is a really strong anchor for me theme but i think what you just said is is really important that you don't have to get it right the first time um that i think that is a such a process of writing is mm -hmm. We, as writers, we we have something to say, and it's 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 it is really deeply lost in there somewhere, and the stories that come out of us are naturally going to reflect that. But we don't necessarily know what it is the first time or the second. I mean, we probably need to know by the time it's ready to be made what that is. But I think that that process of chipping your way into what it's really about is really. And not feeling bad if you don't know it in the first well, draft. It's the joy of it. I reckon yeah. the discovery of. Going, oh, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do or say. Or, yeah. Like sometimes you start with the theme and sometimes you discover the theme, I think. Yeah. yeah, so what you're saying is that the theme might change as you're writing and you shouldn't be a slave to the one that you thought it was yeah. because the theme reveals itself as you keep telling, mm. deepening the story. Yeah. Mm. Oh. And I think it's also a useful tool. So like in One Lane Bridge Series 3, we worked really, really hard on the theme, and I was like, "What is the theme?" And it was like belonging, and that's when we, I really knew that that series was really strong because actually every character had a relationship to belonging. So some, some was being the outsider, you know. Um, some was, "Do you belong to yourself? Do you belong to a place?" You know, every single character, and that kind of by design or by luck, had a relationship with that theme. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that didn't, it was like, oh, okay, now that helped form the, the story and character arcs. I'll just see if there's any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, true story. <laughs> this really is a question for my daughter. Um, my daughter's going to be 23 in December, so she's done the degree, she's a stand-up comedian, she's on tour as a stand-up comedian, you know, for that puppet thing. Um, so she does a lot of, you know, makes film, the whole, sh you know, young people, this is what they do. But she also writes. And her and some friends, because what they do, they're young, they're straight out of university, they do Māori land and all of that. And they wrote her um, a little drama and they know a friend, they wanted to check with the friend. And anyway, they've got a, the friend sent it to another friend who said, um, from America and who said, this is ready to go to market. Now, then she rings me up because I have been in the industry for so long and then she goes, what do we do, Mum? I don't know. I've never written a drama. So what would you do? Like, because that's not to say someone's going to buy it, but the fact that that is writing. Yeah, yeah. It's really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, Could a tutu fenwa, by the way. That's my daughter. <laughs> wow. Um, so, so it's obviously New Zealand based, even though she sent it to a friend in America. Is it, it, it's a New Zealand, it's yeah. a Māori story. And it's just a bunch um, of friends who are just like, you yeah. know, sending it to their friends. And yeah. we just ended up with um, um, someone in America. I mean, that's incredible feedback that it's ready to go to market. I think probably what that means is that if um, 
finding the right ear to talk to next. Yes. But finding the right producer, probably, um, because, um, you know, our job is to build the thing and then um, it's someone else's job to get the thing made. Um, so, it's defi- so, not just sell it? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ring her tonight. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I mean, this is the start of her career. And, and she should, if she's got something powerful, then she should really keep hold of it. Um, and I guess it's sort of, I mean, to me, it would be finding the right person to go and talk to. Uh, which, you know, like, there's a lot of extraordinary Māori producers that, um, that maybe she would be thinking about talking to mm-hmm. first, do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I think that that's what you should tell her is that okay. if it's ready to go to market, the person who will take it to market is a producer who's attached to it. So it's to... Rather um, than just sell it. Right. Okay, so don't sell it. Find a producer to then take it and then stay with it type yeah, thing. Yeah, where would be the good place she could she could ask about producers? Would that be Nga Ahu Fakari or...? Yeah. She's no, worked for no. now for oh, okay. she, Yeah, mm-hmm. and so she knows them. Yeah. Also, um, Sparta, the screen producers, Sparta. they have um, emerging producers and producers lists there. Okay. So that's also something you could do. And I'm sure Tapuna Mataro would have a list of producers in Christchurch. So it's a matter of just perhaps looking at some work that they liked and seeing who the producer of that was and exploring that pathway as well. Yeah, because every young person, you know, when it's producing, they all want Taika Waititi or um, Peter Jackson. Or <laughs> So I say, well, okay, I might just say keep talking to people. The first thing, keep talking to people and understand what's happening here. Great. Because she asked me, but I just didn't know. Great. Can I just say one thing? Get them to sort out their chain of title. So yeah. what you're saying there is um, you said a whole group of them wrote it and when um, this gentleman here just said get them to sort out their chain of title, I guess what you're saying is if there's five people who wrote it, did they write 20% each, um, let's write, put it down in writing that we have equal ownership of this or if they don't agree on that, then they have to agree on what it is before you even take it to a producer. So it's about understanding um, if everyone wants to stay involved. And register it with the writer's guild. Mm. It's really important too. So they have wow. mm. so if they're not joined up with the writer's guild already, that should... That's really important. Because they'll, they'll yeah. give guidance as well on the contracts and how it all works moving forward for them. Mm. So That's yeah, right. Americans, for the love of God, don't let them sign anything. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay Cole, that's really... Thank you. If you haven't think... been paid in the industry before the writer's guild... Uh, you get an associate membership, which is not expensive. It's like 90 yeah. bucks or something. Or, yeah. Because yeah. cool. I trained yeah. at Māori TV, so we didn't do any of this kind of stuff. So no, I'm it's copyright, really what you're talking about. And you don't just sell copyright. There's not really anyone out there who just buys copyright. But what does happen is a producer would say, I'm interested in working with this. Will you assign the copyright to me so that I have the authority to go out and um, find a broadcaster or a platform or funding or something. That's the step. But what's really lovely about what just happened in this room now is the wisdom of crowds. <laughs> you know, like I think it is really good to talk to people because everyone's got a different tangent that they're thinking about. And so it's really nice to um, just not just talk to one friend, but talk to a few friends and say, what do you think? And you don't have to take their advice, but it's really nice to get the wisdom of crowds and to see how it works for you. Do we have any other questions? Kim? Hi, I'm just interested in, um, there's a lot of conversation right now going around about writers holding on to their IP and the whole, like in America, it's a little bit more common for there to be a little bit more of a shared scenario, I guess you could say. Um, You know, like at the Film Commission, if you go for funding, then you have to sign it over to a producer. And coming from America, at first that was really confronting that I'm signing my IP over to somebody um, instead of kind of retaining it in a production company that I'm running or whatever. What are your guys' thoughts on that and the converse, what's kind of happening on the ground, the conversations that writers are having? Or I think it really depends on what kind of writer you are and um, how much risk you want to take and whether you have a, are interested in producing um, because sometimes it's cleaner just to have a transaction with a producer because they take all the risk. They've got to find the money. Um, and for some writers, that's, like, incredibly scary. Um, 
more and more companies are doing like co-productions with, so as a writer, you might make it your own little production company and that you can then co-produce with um, some of the big players so that you still have ownership of it and therefore you are at the table. Um, and some producers are really open to that and some are just like, mm, no, nah, it's either I have it 100% or, or not. So personally, I, I like the idea of, I mean, the other way is you can, for me personally, it's more about the cre having um, the creative um, overview and so you can package that in a way where you're the executive producer so that you it's a it's an, it's a different business model so I think um, I think it, it, ultimately giving writers power is awesome so I'm all for that but I think on an individual case it depends on yeah on how you roll with those things I think also it depends where you sit in your career if you have the mana the power to um, to be able to get a producer to agree to that situation. If you're a new or emerging person, then the producer knows how much work they're going to have to do to get it somewhere, um, and so they might not be willing to do that. But Briar and Michael, you might have some other thoughts about this. Yeah, it depends on the project. I feel, for myself personally, I feel if I've put a whole lot of... Um, of my own intellectual property into an idea or a series that I, I want to share some of the rights. I wouldn't give all the rights over to the producer. And I know in Rurangi, um, it, they were very fairly divided. That was the way um, the producer there worked, mm. Craig. Yeah, I think, I mean, everything that Pip and Bri have said, look like, they, there is, it's a complicated thing to produce a show. Um, and, and so for me increasingly, you know, I pretty much generate almost all, all the work that I do now. And for the really the stuff that is totally in my heart, like the Taina Porter story, which took 10 years of my life kind of thing. And I was absolutely not gonna sign that over to anyone else. So the, we produced that, we were the production company and we took that risk because it was, it was, so special and and, um, and the transgender dance story is, is the same. We're partnering and we're finding the right partners because I can't do, I can't go and find money. That's not, I'm just crap at that. But other people are good at that and are incredibly good at that. So you find the right partners and you make the right mm. and you share the, yeah. which is the way it should be written. I, I yeah. work sometimes as a writer for hire and then I don't, you know, it's a whole different story. It's someone else's yeah. IP yeah. and you're yeah. paid to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got one question over here. A couple minutes, got about two minutes left, I think. Kia ora. Um, Strusilla, I've actually been working, I did theatre in 1984. I've got a trade and I'm doing all these other things. I'm getting pulled. I'm in constant conflict with myself. And, you know, and like now um, because of the earthquake, cost me 45000 I did all the hearings. I've got a 100 grand tied up in stock, you know, and I still, in my play, I've been working on for eight years. One of them is a children's production and I'm just, um, I'm buying dolls and models because I'm dyslexic to do a photo shoot. What's your question? And my question is, are you, are you do you find that you're in conflict with yourself, you know, when you, because I didn't want to write these stories. They just won't leave me alone. They just keep coming back. What do you think? Do you have... Are you had that with Tene? Um, with, with Tena. Ten, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing that you're identifying as a problem is actually a strength, probably. There's something really burning inside you that you're doing... You're going to the length of putting together dolls and doing a photo shoot. Uh, but um, I think what you've got... I mean... To me, the most powerful stories are the ones that burn so much inside you that you can't leave them alone. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. It's just, uh, I think it's finding the way to take the next step is, you know, turning your photo shoot into something that are, is going to get made somehow and finding the right people to get involved, really. We're setting the drama company up um, mm. next, um, the end of this year. And we're going, we're going into the Arts Centre 226. Awesome. 
Awesome. And I think I wouldn't be worried about how long they take. Like, I've certainly had that feeling where, like, every idea has its time. So even if you aren't writing it inside you, in your body, in your mind, in your subconscious, it's all kind of marinating away. And when it is ready and when you are ready, it will come out for sure, especially if you keep being drawn back to them and you can't, um, if they won't leave you alone, then that might, yeah. Mm. So that's also useful time, I guess. I guess it's not a negative that they're not. It's all per, I, like per, I call it like percolating. We'll do one last question at the back there. Hi, I love schedules and structure, and so I would just be very interested to know what each of your average writing days looks like. I like that question. Mm, yeah. Why don't we start with you, Briar? Um, it depends on, look, this is a terrible thing, but um, I'm quite often driven by deadlines. And so even after all this time, I'm one of these people that starts out quite slowly. But I believe that writing, writing happens a lot when you're just thinking. So I, I believe that I can walk down the beach and I'm pondering a story and trying to kind of crack something that solutions come to me that would not sit, come to me if I'm sitting like hammering away at the keyboard. So, yeah, I don't have a regular, um, an average day, but when things are really kicking in, I like to start pretty early and um, probably about, um, I don't know, early, like seven o'clock and then have a break and then come back. But also I don't, I don't know about you, Michael and um, but I can't um, I can't sustain writing writing like if I do four hours I'm pretty happy if I did four hours solid writing a day I'd be pretty happy with that fantastic Michael um, I think we're kind of twins a little bit I'm totally about schedule and structure I'm a member of the five o'clock club um, it's actually the four thirty club now I get up at four thirty I've got undiagnosed something I I um, <laughs> So my character in my novel, she runs 10.13 kilometres every morning. I walk 10.13 kilometres. If it's 10.14, my day is ruined. Um, so I, I come home and, um, but, but this is a tip. Um, to me, I think it's a, that exercise first thing in the morning, um, which kind of like, and science backs this, it's, it's an oxygen, oxygenating thing, for, not for just for your body, for, for this. Um, and... Um, and yeah, I start work seven-ish, eight-ish, um, and um, yeah, I'm kind of really disciplined. Um, and and yeah, and st structure is kind of everything for me in terms of it, it's an insecure job and an insecure future. And so having some security about how I'm going to approach it is just it, it is, is, is a it's a a, a safety blanket for me. And yeah. Is that yeah. um, five days a week, seven days a week, four days a week? Usually five days a week, but quite often, like right now, seven days a week. Yeah. Right, because you've had yeah. a deadline. Yeah. 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 Pip? Yeah, I think that really depends on where I am in the process. Like um, some, yeah, yeah, sometimes seven days a week and the deadlines just make you get up real early and drive you right through. Um if it was a more natural process, like I try and identify when my most productive time of the day is. So it used to be when I was younger at night. Mm. So I used to work at night. Now that doesn't work for me. Now I'm in the morning. Mm. And I, Woody Allen had this tip. It's a bad habit to get into, like in some ways, but it's also really good. He said he keeps his computer by the bed and as soon as he wakes up, he just takes it and he starts writing. So I, I did that for ages. Not good for your posture quite good for your writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also a massive fan of the naps. For me, I write maybe like three or four hours, then I have a big sleep. I'm a really good napper. Um, and then I wake up and then I just do, usually it's going back, that's when I do my rewriting because that's actually writing, right, is the rewriting. Then I use post-nap to then go back over the, um, Work the more, the, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of my schedule. Wow. Um, Pitt Paul, Briar Gray Smith and Michael Bennett, thank you very much. Once again, thank you to Screen Cranterby New Zealand for allowing us to use this room. 
uh, Images and Sound, South Island Media, David and Sook, and also the New Zealand Film Commission, and of course our wonderful speakers. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you thanks to generous support from the New Zealand Film Commission, Tapuna Matero, Screen Canterbury New Zealand, South Island Media, and Images and Sound. The voiceover was recorded by Jamie Irvine, and music is by Poddington Bear. You can read more about these speakers at our website, www.scriptoscreen.co.nz.